And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, we've been going through a sermon series about the end times, the last days. In part one of our series, we looked at the apostasy, the prophecy of the last time of the church in which there will be great apostasy, and that's in the time of Laodicea. And during that uh, session of, of teaching, we looked at the seven churches and how prophetically they lined up with the uh, almost 2,000 years of the church age. The church age is more or less 2,000 years long. I'll go ahead and write that up here. And uh, then, in part two, we looked at the rapture and what the Bible says about the rapture and when it will be. And I firmly believe that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. And as a matter of fact, we'll actually get into that even more today to prove that the rapture has to happen before this time period. But uh, today what we're going to look at is the tribulation period, also known as Daniel's 70th week. And uh, we want to look at that today because, like I said, this sermon series will be on the end times, starting with the end of the church, then the rapture, and then the tribulation, and then we'll continue from there. And what I was going to do today, I thought, was talk about the Antichrist as well. But there's so much to say about the Antichrist that I figure, you know what, I'll just make that next week's sermon and devote the entire sermon on the Antichrist, because there's a lot of information about the Antichrist. So I might mention the Antichrist a little bit, but what I really want to do is to talk about this tribulation period, this time here, known as the tribulation, which, by the way, is a period of seven years. Now, you've got to be careful. Some people preach differently. Some people don't follow the Word of God. Some people say there's only three and a half years of tribulation. Well, we'll see from the Bible what's true. Is it seven years? I believe it is. Is it a pre-tribulation rapture? I believe it is. So we looked at part one, and it came here. Then we looked at part two here. This is going to be our part three. And as I'm going through and trying to get these sermons together, it looks like we might end up with exactly seven sermons. So this entire sermon series will, seven, will be seven different messages. So that's pretty amazing how God always uses the number seven and kind of neat how this sermon series will end up with seven teachings all total. And that will include Armageddon, uh, the teaching on the millennium, and we'll probably talk about uh, the judgment, the great white throne of judgment. So hopefully all total, I'll have seven preaching and teachings on our end times series. So I hope that they will be edifying to you and be encouraged because it's so amazing to know history before it happens. And according to the Word of God, the Bible, we know exactly what's about to take place in these last days. And so that's pretty amazing. So, like I said, I was going to talk about the Antichrist a little bit, but I will devote next time to completely covering the Antichrist more in detail. So today we're going to look at the tribulation period, and I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a play-by-play -play of what's going to take place in these seven years. Now, I can't go too in detail. All I have is about an hour. So this will be a crash course, if you will. Maybe you're a Christian, you want to learn more about end-time events. Well, this is just kind of a, a cliff note, if you will. Um, try to go over it as quickly as possible, just so you'll know what's going to happen. And then hopefully in the future I can go more in detail. I would love to go verse by verse teaching through the book of Revelation and hopefully we can do that someday. But right now we've got to finish our verse by verse through the epistles of Paul. Then I'll do he, uh, Hebrews and Acts and debating, maybe do John first before we get to Revelation. So today we're going to look at two books. We so actually might look at a few more. But two very, very important books and that is the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're not saved, you don't know very much about the Bible. And I would encourage you to get into the Bible and read it because it is unlike any book ever in the history of the world. It is a book of prophecy. Daniel wrote his book about more or less 500 B.C. And the book of Revelation was written, I believe, more or less around 90 A.D. So you have about 600 years difference. About. And they both talk about many of the same things. 
It's quite incredible. How could these guys writing about 600 years apart write something and they line up perfectly and they don't contradict? And they all point to a future time over here. Now the neat thing about these books is they, they give prophecy. And Daniel has prophesied of things to come and they took place. Revelation is prophesying of things to come in agreement with the book of Daniel. So if the book of Daniel has some prophecies in it that did take place, then we know that it's true. So if there are future prophecies of this time, then we must know that they're true. I don't understand how anybody can say, well, man wrote that book, I don't believe the Bible, that's a bunch of garbage, when it's already been proven right many times by many of these Old Testament prophecies that literally came to pass. Old Clarence Larkin wrote a book entitled The Book of Daniel, wrote a commentary on Daniel. And boy, if you get a chance to get this, that's a pretty cool book. How he goes through and shows many of the prophecies that God gave to Daniel and how they literally came to pass. Daniel actually prophesied of Alexander the Great. And I, in this book here, um, Larkin gives us the story of how when Alexander the Great came down from Macedonia and Greece and came down into Israel, the priests of Israel literally opened up all the gates to Jerusalem when he was at the door and came out with their scrolls and said, Okay, Alexander, we know exactly who you are. You're this he-goat mentioned in the book of Daniel. <laughs> and and uh, Alexander the Great was so impressed. He was like, Wow! I was prophesied of to come many years before, and you guys have... And he was just baffled, and that's why he didn't destroy Jerusalem. He said, wow. Okay, well you... So, even the great leaders of the world believed the Bible. What's your excuse? Because it's clear that they were prophesied of in the Scriptures. So we have these two books written about 600 years apart, and they speak about future events. Some of those future events have taken place, which proves that the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy that prophesied of things that truly came to pass. Yet both of these books deal with a specific time period in the future. And that time period, both of them mention, is over here, this tribulation period. So what I'd like to do is look at both Daniel and Reve Revelation today, as well as other passages about this time called the tribulation. Now what is the tribulation? It's the time after the church leaves in which the Antichrist will come and rule and reign. So the Antichrist will be here ruling for seven years. And God gives the Antichrist, actually, the whole world to rule over for seven years. But it's also a time in which God comes back to Israel. So it's God allowing the Antichrist to rule, but God also comes back to Israel. So this is a time period in which God goes to dealing with with Israel. This is why we know the church won't be there. But today many people say, no, 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 the church has to go through the tribulation. I, I uh, had a video sent to me by a, by a watcher, someone that watches my videos the other day, and they said, oh, Brother Breaker, you've got to watch this video. It's an hour and 20 minutes long, and oh, the guy just explains it so well. And the guy goes through, and it's obvious what he did. He's using a different version of the Bible, so he confused the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. And he ended up saying that the, tr the rapture of the church is right here at the end of the tribulation. <laughs> and he's going through and he's just like a bull in a china cabinet talking like he knows what he's talking about. And he doesn't see that this is for Israel. And so that's the problem. Many people today, they don't rightly divide the word of truth. And they don't see why Jacob, uh, uh, this time is for Jacob, this time is a time of the tribulation which God devoted to the people of Israel to bring back Israel to Him. And we find that this last seven year period is prophesied in Daniel. So what I want to do today is I want to show you that. I'm going to go to Daniel, I'm going to read some passages to show you the prophecy and how this is the final week of the prophecy of Daniel. But before I do, I want to look at three different verses of what this time period known as the tribulation is called. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7 first. And we're just going to go by what the Bible says about this. Amen. I want you to see what the Bible calls it. I don't want to teach what a man teaches. You know, sometimes I'll hold up a book like Larkin's book. Well, I don't teach it because they teach it. I teach it because the Bible teaches it. It just so happens that they agree with the Bible, so they're a good source to read as well. But sometimes you'll read a book and a man will teach what he believes rather than what the Bible says. So you have to be careful 
uh, following a man, we have to only go to the scriptures. But in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, it talks about this day, this time period. And Jeremiah 37 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Well, what is this time period? It's the tribulation. It's Daniel's 70th week. And notice what it's called. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. So why would a Christian be in a time of Jacob's trouble? Huh. Doesn't really make sense, does it? Why would we even be there if it's God showing Israel and, and, and putting them through trouble so that they'll come to their Messiah? Why would the church even be there? I've said it before, and I've got to say it again. I've got to mention it, that the rapture was not revealed until Paul, the Apostle Paul. So the rapture was a mystery back here in the time of Jesus. And Jesus talks a lot in Matthew chapter 24 about end times events. And people try to read Matthew 24 and say, well, the rapture's there. Why would the rapture be in the writings of Jesus if it was a mystery that was not revealed until Paul? So if you're going to these old passages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which apply to this tribulation, and you're trying to find the rapture, you have a problem because the rapture was not revealed to them. So it won't work. And I don't have time to go into that. One of these days I'd like to, because there are some things that take place to the Jews. And people say, well, that looks like a rapture. Well, I don't want to shock you, but there just might be two raptures. You know, the truth is, there's seven raptures, and someday, oh, I wish I'd already done it, I had planned to do a teaching on the seven raptures in the Bible, and there's actually a rapture for Jews that takes place, but that's something else, and that's toward the end of the tribulation. So they confuse the rapture of the church with another rapture that's later on that Jesus spoke about, but I don't have time to get into that, I digress. <laughs> So let's go back here, and in uh, Jeremiah 37, we saw that this time period, this tribulation, is not for Christians. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. That's what it's called. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30. This is probably the earliest verse in the Bible that talks about the tribulation period, possibly. Uh, possibly the earliest. But without a doubt, this applies to this time period. It's prophecy in the book of Deuteronomy of the tribulation. We'll look at what God says to the Jewish people in Deuteronomy 4.30. When thou art in tribulation... And all these things are come upon thee. Now people say, oh, well, that means tribulation. They're, the whole history of the Jewish race is tribulation. They always go through troubles. They're always persecuted. Uh, no, no, no. Let's, let's read the whole verse. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice. So there is a time in the latter days of tribulation for whom? For Israel. And it's in the latter days. Now remember, we saw Paul said in the last days, perilous times shall come. So the latter days in the Bible starts with the end of the church and the rapture, and then begins with the tribulation. Then comes Armageddon, and then the millennial reign of Christ. So this is what the Bible calls the last days. So in these last days, the latter days, God will put the Jews through a time of tribulation. Now Daniel chapter 9 if you'll go there with me, a lot of people say, well, I read the verses with you, but you go too fast. And, and many of them have told me that they just hit the space bar, I guess, to, to, uh, to pause it. And if you have to do that, please do that. I want you to read the verses yourself. I want you to see what I'm saying from the Scriptures. Uh, don't just take my word for it. Read it for yourself to see if that's what it says. So here in Daniel chapter 9, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read verse 24 through 29. And here we have a prophecy of 70 weeks. This prophecy, once again, is for the Jews only. Nowhere within this prophecy is anything given to a church, or the church age, or people saved under Paul's gospel. Because this was all a mystery about Paul. So this is all applying to Jews only. I'm going to show you how it literally took place, a lot of this prophecy, but yet it's open-ended for one final seven-year week. And by the way, when it talks about weeks here in this passage, it's a week of uh, seven years, not a week of seven days, like we say, the week. This is a prophecy, which quite interestingly enough, is a prophecy of seven weeks, but the weeks are of seven years. So that makes 490 years, and we'll get into that. So, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, who are thy people? Well, Daniel was a Jew. 
So God says these 70 weeks are for your people. It's for them and them alone. It's a Jewish prophecy to the Jewish people. Why would the church be in that time if it's a time for Jacob, not for us who are saved? Seventy weeks are determined on thy people, upon thy holy city, and to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now three score is twenty. <clears throat> so... Uh, three score, uh, well a score is 20, so three score is 60 in two weeks, so 62. 62 plus 7 is 69, so 69 weeks. And then it says here, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now remember, a flood. We're going to look at that a little bit later in Revelation. Verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, this is the final verse, 27, of this prophecy. And it's the final week. So a week is of seven years. And he says here, there was something that takes place. And he will confirm a covenant. Who is he? Well, I believe it's talking about the Antichrist. He shall confirm the week with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination, she shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation that shall be determined to be poured upon the desolate. Well, what is poured upon the desolate? Well, in the book of Revelation, God pours out some wrath with some vials and with some cups and with all these different things in the book of Revelation. So this is the prophecy of 70 weeks. Now Daniel, this book of Daniel by Clarence Larkin. Clarence Larkin was an amazing man. He, By trade, he was a, a, a what do you call it, a, not a drafter, but someone that drafts up plans and such. And so he was very good at drawing, and I guess you can't see that very well, but he drawed out the whole 70 week, the whole tribulation seven year period in his book of Daniel. And here again, he has Daniel's 70th week. I know that's very small. You probably can't see it too well. That's why you need to find the book and get it. <laughs> but also in the uh, Dispensational Truth book that I've shown you many times. is a great, great book. He also has it here. It's a little bit bigger. And it's Daniel's 70th or 70 weeks. And he talks about the last of the 70th week. So the Bible is not a boring book. When you start getting into things like this and seeing the charts and seeing what God said and looking at these prophecies and seeing how they were fulfilled, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Yet people say, ah, oh, the Bible, you know, that boring old book puts me to sleep. Not me, man. It keeps me up at night thinking about these things because it's amazing to have a book that claims to be from God, and I believe it is, that prophesies of future events and it exactly takes place exactly the way the Bible says. And yet, you don't want to read it. Huh. I do. I want to see what it says. So, here's the prophecy. But let me first say, once more, dogmatically, this is a prophecy to Jews. And in all of it, the first 69 weeks and the last week, is all to Jews. The church wasn't even in the prophecy. wasn't even revealed yet. So it all deals with Jews. Now, what was the prophecy? Well... We just read it, but let me see if I can write it out here in a way in which you can understand. In about 445 B.C., there was a command. And you read through the book of Daniel, it tells you there's a command. And there was seven weeks that took place, and that came out to 49 years until something happened. And I don't have time to go into everything that happened. So you had 49 years take place here, or seven weeks. Now remember, he said the seven weeks and then the 72 weeks. So the seven weeks took place, and I can't remember if it was the building of Jerusalem or to, to go back to Jerusalem. But then you had 62 weeks that came, and according to the prophecy, then the Messiah shall show up. And at that 62 weeks was 434 years. Now, if this 70 weeks is a week of 70 years, then 70 times 7 is 490 now what we have already taken place in the prophecy exactly as it was written was 
434 years, and then this took place in seven weeks, or 49 years. So 49 plus 434 is 483 years. 483 years of this prophecy have already taken place to the letter exactly as was written by Daniel. So 483 minus 490 is a seven year difference. So the 69, see 62 plus 7 is 69. 69 weeks have taken place exactly as written in the book of Daniel. One week, one seven year period has not taken place yet. That's the one that takes place here. That's why it's called Daniel's 70th week. And I believe it takes place after the tribulation. Now, what takes place in this 70th week? Well, that's in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, which we just read. But let me read it again. And he, I believe it's the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination she shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, this 70 week, or 70th week, this seven year period of the tribulation, called Daniel's 70th week, or Jacob's trouble, or tribulation, will be a, a seven year thing. But in the Bible, what's so amazing is that and I don't even have time to go in it. There's so many places to go into this. Uh, just read the book of, of um, Jacobo. What is that in the English? I'm throwing a blank here. The book of uh, James. The Bible divides this seven-year period into three and a half years and three and a half years. 3.5 plus 3.5 is 7. There's a division in the very midst. The midst means middle. Three and a half years is exactly 42 months. And if you read the Bible, quite often when it's talking in the book of Revelation about the tribulation period, it says something's going to happen and then there'll be 42 more months. So this seven years of tribulation is divided in half. And we are told here in the prophecy of Daniel that when this tribulation takes place, someone is going to make a covenant and in the middle of that, he's going to break it. And when he breaks that covenant that he made with the Jewish people, because it's a prophecy to the Jews, there's going to be an abomination that takes place. And that abomination is going to take place in the middle of this final week. Well, you know in the Bible there's something called the abomination of desolation? And without the book of uh, Revelation, we have no idea what Daniel is talking about here. But the book of Revelation tells us about a coming Antichrist that will someday come into a Jewish rebuilt temple and will sit down in that temple, and Paul tells us even this, he'll sit down in that temple on the, on the throne and say, I am God, the Antichrist. And that will be an abomination of desolation. An abomination for the Antichrist to go into Israel and sit on the throne and say, I'm God, not that Jesus fellow. So all this is prophecy of things to come. Now the reason I wanted to teach this and try to explain it to you is because you will probably see these things happen in your lifetime. Matter of fact, probably within the next couple of years. And if you're not saved, you will be in that period. And you will be seeing this. But you don't have to go through that horrible time. You can get out at the rapture. That's why you need to be saved. But if you're not saved, and the rapture takes place tomorrow, I've done my best to make these videos and leave them online, and hopefully they'll stay there, on YouTube and on Vimeo, to where you that are left behind can read and look at that and read your Bible and see what's happening in the world is exactly what the Bible said. So there'll be an abomination of desolation. There'll be a covenant made with the United Nations and the Antichrist with Israel saying, oh, we'll let you keep your land. And everything's all hunky-dory. And the Jews get to rebuild their temple again and worship in their temple. But then in the midst of that seven years, the Antichrist will march right in and kick the Jews out. Take over their temple and sit down in their temple and say, I am God. Little g. And that will be the abomination of which this speaks. Now how do you know that? Because that's written as well in the book of Revelation. But also, now let's go to Matthew. Also, it's written, this is so amazing, in the book of Matthew. Now, 
I've got to explain this because there are some people that, why is it that people always want to take the wrong interpretation of something to explain it away in order to not believe it? I don't know why that is, but there are a lot of people today that believe that they, when the Bible is talking about this in Daniel, the abomination of desolation, they believe that took place over here in the time of Jesus. And they believe that everything that was written in Daniel and in Revelation took place in 70 A.D., which is kind of funny because the book of Revelation is written in 90 A.D., so without a doubt, those prophecies are still future. But there was something that took place in 70 A.D. that sounds a lot like this abomination of desolation. And what's so amazing is that when God gives a prophecy, it's not just for one time, it's oftentimes for two times. He prophesies this is going to take place, and it does, but then in the future, the same exact thing takes place again. So there are many prophecies in the Bible that can take place more than one time. And that's something to think about, and it's something that's interesting. So in Matthew chapter 24, and verse 15, Jesus mentions what we just read of in Daniel, this abomination. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, it says, And this gospel, excuse me, 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, when he stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So there will be Jews in their land that see something spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and when they see it, they're to flee into the mountains. They're to flee from Jerusalem. They're to flee to, is from Israel. Because, as we read in Daniel, and as we're going to read in Revelation, when this Antichrist comes in and sits down, he's going to immediately say, Now, I want all Jews dead. And we already read it, and it's quite amazing. He said there's going to be a flood that he tries to do to kill those Jews. And i gotta, I got to tell you this. He's not successful. Thanks be to God. The people are saved. The people of Israel are saved. And they're not destroyed by the Antichrist. But here's the amazing thing. Okay, This is what's so interesting. This is all future. Because Daniel's 70th week is way out here. But many people who want to disbelieve the Bible, they say, well, that's not talking about this future. You're, you're, you're wrong. This took place in 70 A.D. So let's look at history. What took place in 70 A.D.? In 70 A.D., that's 70 years after Jesus was born. Keep in mind that Jesus died in 33 A.D. So in 70 A.D., which, by the way, I believe uh, the Apostle Paul died probably 68, 69 A.D., so the Apostle Paul didn't even get to see this. But in 70 A.D., the Romans came into Israel. And the Romans took over. Well, well they were already there. But secular history tells us that the, the Jews, man, they fought against the Romans. They wanted their nation back. And the Romans got so fed up that in 70 A.D. they sent all their armies into Israel. And in 70 A.D., a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, which by the way, what an interesting name, because that literally means the God made manifest. <laughs> what a weird name. guy going around calling himself, I am the God made manifest. He went into Jerusalem, and he did an abomination in the temple of the Jews. We're told by secular history that he said, no more is this a temple for Jehovah. This is not a temple for God. He said, I'm going to take over this temple, and I dedicate it to Zeus. And this guy, Antiochus, took a pig. Now, you know what a pig is, right? Jews do not like pork. They do not like pigs. But this Gentile, Antiochus Epiphanes, took a pig into the temple and sacrificed it as a sacrifice on the altar to Zeus rather than God. Now during that time and then after, many people have said, well, that's the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel. And that's why Jesus spoke about it, because he was telling his, his uh, Jewish followers about 40 years before it took place, be careful, this is going to take place. And there's many people out there, you'll probably find them on YouTube, I've met them before, that are very adamant that the book of Revelation is not talking about future events out here. It was written about events that took place back then. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because the book of Revelation was written in around 90 AD after those events took place. So clearly that was not the prophecy. It's still a future prophecy. But it's interesting that it did take place. So some of the prophecies of the Bible have a dual application. 
Yeah! Some of the things that Jesus was preaching back there, they actually did take place within 30, 40 years of what he said. And the Jews could have looked at that and said, wow, that Jesus guy, he knew what was happening. He was prophesying. And they should have believed him, but they didn't. But that prophecy of Daniel didn't apply to this only. There is a future prophecy of that 70th week that is still out here. So isn't that amazing how some of the prophecies of God have dual applications? I just think that's so interesting. Not only does it happen once, it happens more than once. Now, Matthew 24, 2 says, this is Jesus speaking. Well, let me read verse 1 also. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So in Jesus' day, there was a temple built in Israel. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon an altar that shall not be thrown down. <clears throat> now, if you go to Jerusalem today, you know what you find? There's no Jewish temple. It's not there. What happened is after 70 AD, a few years after, someone went around telling the Romans, somehow this, this, little, uh, this little thing got started, that the Jews hoarded all of their gold and silver under the Jewish temple. So those Romans ran out and they tore down all the stones of the Jewish temple looking for gold. I don't know if they found any. Um, you know, the Knights Templar say they supposedly found it during the Crusades. and That's where the international bankers started and all this stuff. I'm not going to go there. But uh, they tore it down just as Jesus prophesied. So Jesus in his earthly ministry is prophesying things to come. And sometimes they came not 30, 40 years after him. But you know what's interesting is that's not just a prophecy of this. He was also prophesying about here, after the church age, of something that will take place during the time of Jacob's troubles. And I just find that so amazing that God can give more than one prophecy, and, and well, one prophecy, but it can apply to more than one time period. So, now with that stated, um, let's go to the book of Revelation. And let's go through the book of Revelation. Let's look at this time period known as the tribulation because many of these prophecies are still future. You know, like I say, there's some people that don't believe it. They just want to believe all oh, those prophecies were fulfilled here and that's it and it's over. And many people believe that. They don't believe in a rapture. So those who believe that the prophecies were fulfilled here, they don't believe that the rapture takes the church out. They believe the church goes all the way through the tribulation. But was Daniel's 70th week, did it take place during the time of Jesus? No. It must still be future. So there must be a rapture first so that the church gets out and God goes back. And remember in our uh, sermon about the rapture, I talked a little bit about Esther. How the book of Esther is a type of a Gentile bride leaving so that a Jewish bride can come in to save Israel. So the Jews are in this time period. And there is an Antichrist figure in the book of Esther, Haman who tries to kill the Jews, but he ends up dying. Well, that's exactly what the book of Revelation tells us. The Antichrist comes on the scene, tries to kill the Jews with the flood, but he's the one that ends up and gets it in the neck. So all these uh, prophecies are future. Now, go to the book of Revelation, and let's look at here, um, in page 181 here. I like sometimes just to show you some things from this book of, of Daniel in uh, some of the books of, uh, what's his name, Larkin. And what's so amazing about the book of Revelation, it's like seven this, seven that, seven. There's so many sevens in the book of Revelation. Quite a while back, I had a sermon that I preached on Bible numerics, and I showed how numbers mean things. Seven is the number of completion. And God is always using that number seven. That's why there were 70 weeks of seven years per week. And so God is always using seven churches. And in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven personages, seven vials, seven dooms, and seven new things. So seven is the number of completion. How interesting. So the book of Revelation is future prophecy. It's not written about something that took place way back then. The book of Revelation is written about something that takes place in the future. And it corresponds with the book of Daniel. So obviously Daniel's 70th week is still future. It has not been fulfilled here. It still applies to a future event. Now, look at page 198 here. Let me just show you a couple of places and we'll get ready. This is important. I wish I had time to go into this. 
but he talks about some things and man I just I wish I had all the time in the world <laughs> to go into some things but he talks about how in Daniel's 70th week what Daniel prophesied we have a a prince that comes and makes a seven-year covenant with the Jews in the first half then he breaks that covenant in the middle of the tribulation and the last half is a period of desolation that's what Daniel says well Jesus comes and when Jesus shows up, Jesus talks about this future tribulation. And he warns in Matthew chapter 24 that in the first part of this, there's famines, there's wars, there's earthquakes. They're beginning of sorrows, Jesus says. Then Jesus says in Matthew 24, 19, or 15 through 19, what we've read, is that there will be a desolation, abomination of desolation. Something happens in the middle of this time in which an abomination takes place. And then Jesus warns, in the last half, he says there will be a period of tribulation such as there never has been before, nor ever shall be again. The last half of the tribulation, the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. This is the time when God's wrath is poured out on the world in, in, in cups and vials and, and things like that. So we see the book of, trib of Daniel lines up with a future 70th week. We see the words of Jesus line up and they apply to this, not just this. And we see also the words of the book of John, of Revelation, has it all in order of a seven year period. Now the book of Revelation, chapter 5, has the seals and the trumpets. Then chapter 12, it says the dragon cast out on the earth and incarnate, incarnates himself as the Antichrist. So we have him showing up. And then the last half of the tribulation is three and a half years of the vile and the great tribulation and, and the wrath being poured out. So all of them, Revelation, Daniel, and Jesus, all confirm a seven-year period divided in half in which it starts with a man ruling. Then that man does something abominable, so bad that God gets so angry that the last three and a half years he pours out a lot on the earth. And, during that time, he saves Israel. So you've got to understand, you've got to realize that the tribulation is a future seven-year event. A future seven-year event for the Jews. And for the Jews only. Now, uh, a, a buddy sent me this in the mail not too long ago. Quite an interesting book. I've been reading through it a little bit. And uh, in this book, it tells you something quite interesting, and I, I thought this was amazing. I really like this. It's on this page over here. I'll read it to you. But this book says that as the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give four separate accounts of Jesus' time here on earth. So we have four accounts of Jesus' first coming. And that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now when God wants you to know something, He says it not just once but twice and sometimes he's so important he says it three times but when God gives you something four times you need to get a hold of it because it's important so God gave four accounts of his coming in the, the Gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John all talk about this time period before Jesus dies and at the very end of the books, then it goes into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that they're all talking about this time before before Jesus dies and what happens immediately after his resurrection. Well, as the four Gospels give four separate accounts of Jesus' time here on earth, likewise, the book of Revelation takes you through the tribulation four separate times. And so what this guy, this author, is saying, and it's quite interesting, and as having read through uh, Revelation again, I see it. I, I see a lot of people that don't see it. But we see four separate accounts in Revelation of the tribulation and let's hope that I have room here I hope I'm not writing too low I'll give you those right here one two three and four does that show up yep barely on the bottom here the first account is chapters five through six when it talks about the seals I, like I say, I'm trying to not go into too, too much detail here. There's so much I could talk about. I want to give you the brief overview. 
but in such a way that you can go and study it for yourself and find this and see this. So please, don't just take what I'm saying. Do some further study on all this. Chapter 8 through 11 talks about the trumpets. Chapters 12 through 14 gives us a, about the Antichrist and what he's doing in this time period. And chapters 15 through 19 give you the seven vials. So what this author says, and, and as I've read through Revelation, it makes a lot of sense, is that as we have in the Bible four accounts of Jesus' ministry, in the book of Revelation, what God did to John was give him four separate accounts of the same thing. And so when you're reading through the book of Revelation, you know what you're reading? You're reading about the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, and God tells you four different times an account of what takes place in that seven year period. It's quite interesting and quite amazing. So it's so important that you understand that number one, Daniel's 70th week is future and it's this time after the rapture. And that number two, the book of Revelation, it, it starts with the churches, the seven churches. But then chapter four of the book of Revelation says there's a door open in heaven. Well, when that door is open, See here, I'm not good at drawing doors. That's supposed to be an open door. That's a type of the church going out. So when the church goes out, the entire rest of the book of Revelation is not dealing with the church. It's not dealing with the rapture of the church. It's all about Israel and the tribulation in which the Antichrist comes on the scene. And the church is gone. So once you understand that, you don't fall into false doctrine trying to say, well, the rapture's back here in Matthew, Mark, Louis, and John. No, it's not. Jesus never spoke about the rapture of the church. He couldn't because the church had not been revealed. And the rapture had not been revealed to Paul. There are seven mysteries that God revealed unto Paul. I have a video about that. You can look them up. So when Jesus is talking in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Matthew 24, he's telling Jews, just like Daniel is telling Jews, of things that will take place in this tribulation period to Jews. So the church is not going through the tribulation. Why would we? Why would we go through the tribulation? So what I would like to do as I finish this message is try, and I won't, won't, don't want to go too much in detail on this, is to try to give you kind of a play-by-play -play of what will happen in the tribulation period. We're told four different times things that will take place in the tribulation. And as you read the Bible, it's so, so simple to find. Like I said, next time I'll talk about the man of sin or the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist. But let me just briefly mention that the Bible calls him two names. It calls him the man of sin, M-O-S, and the son of perdition. Two separate names of the Antichrist, but he's the same Antichrist. Why does the Bible give him two names? Because in the Bible we're told that in the middle of this tribulation, this seven years in which he takes over the world, he's assassinated. And he dies, and he's buried, literally. He had a deadly wound that's healed, and he comes back to life. And when he comes back to life, he is Satan incarnate. So Satan actually comes inside of the Antichrist. And so for the last three and a half years, it's literally Satan who is ruling on this earth in the body that was the body of the man, the Antichrist. Now, like I said, I want to get to that in the next message, and I'll go into the Antichrist. And what my plan is, oh, I'm looking forward to it. Daniel gives a lot of prophecies about this Antichrist and the things that he does. And it's pretty amazing. And we'll go through that. We'll look at the Antichrist. And then once more, we'll look at the tribulation and, and how he's ruling. But I want you to get straight in your head that this tribulation period, after the rapture, is seven years. Don't believe people that say it's only three and a half. You know, there's some people that say, well, it's three and a half only left because three and a half took place here. I don't believe that. There's a future seven years. And there has to be a future seven years because this man has to die and be buried for three days and come back. And that can't happen if he lived way back here 2,000 years ago. So it's all going to take place in a seven-year period together. Because we just read in Daniel 9.27, there is a literal one-week or seven-year uh, covenant. And this man, the Antichrist, breaks it in the middle. So it's all got to be a future seven years. 
So I want you to get a hold of that. I want you to understand that. So let's look briefly, quickly at the book of Revelation. What happens if you miss the rapture? God forbid. Well, if you're here on the earth, you can take the book of Revelation and literally start reading it, and you will see everything that's written in the book of Revelation take place exactly like it says in the time in which you live. That's why it's so important to get saved now if you're not saved, because I don't want to go through the tribulation. I'm saved and I'm leaving. I have a blessed hope. I am not Israel, so I don't intend to be a part of that 70th week prophecy for Israel. When the church is the light of the world today, but Jesus told back here, the Jews, you're the light of the world. You can't have two lights at the same time. So the light of the world here goes out and then God goes back. Uh, Romans 11, Paul talks about the restoration of Israel. God's not done with Israel. He's going to come back to them, but after the church is gone. So let's start here in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, speaking a lot about the different uh, churches. We looked at those, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, maybe it's Sardis and Smyrna, Philadelphia, Laodicea, I always get those two S's mixed up. And, and we looked at those. Now in Revelation 4, 1, that's the first times the heavens are open in the book of Revelation. And when the heavens are open, someone, John, goes up. That's a type of the rapture. We don't see anybody coming back down in the book of Revelation until Revelation 19.11 when Jesus comes back at Armageddon, the second advent. But we have four separate accounts in the books from chapters 5 all the way to 19 of what happens here. And each one of those accounts it says, and then comes Jesus at Armageddon. So it's like each one of those counts is giving us an order of the tribulation. And God doesn't tell you once or twice. He tells you four times this is how it's going to take place. And that's so amazing. So we actually can do a play-by-play, -play, get an idea of the things that will actually take place in that seven-year period. So let's look at this, okay? Let's go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, he's caught up into heaven. John. John, by the way, is a type of the church in many different ways. And uh, it's a type of the rapture here because he says, come up hither. And that was where a trumpet talking with me. Well, when the rapture comes, it'll be at the last trump. And he went up to heaven and it tells us what heaven is like. So it kind of gives us an idea of what you'll see when you get to heaven. In heaven, there's four and twenty seats, four and twenty elders. There's a sea of glass. Um, there are some beasts around the throne, which are, are quite interesting looking, the cherubs. Uh, they're saying holy, holy, and, and many different things here in chapter 4. So I can't get into chapter 4 too much, but it's a type of the rapture and someone being raptured out and what he sees in heaven. Chapter 5 then begins our first account of this seven-year period. And in chapter 5, we see some things, and it's still up in heaven. Now, when the rapture takes place, we who are Christians, we are up here in heaven while this tribulation is taking place down here. And there will be what's called the judgment seat of Christ during this time. So Christians come out and go before Jesus Christ to find the rewards that they've done. And then they come back with Jesus at Armageddon. So many people ask me, well, where do we Christians go when the rapture takes place? Well, we go out to be judged. But when we're judged, we're not judged by our sins. Our sins were paid for back here. Our sins were judged on Calvary. What we're judged for at the judgment seat of Christ when we go at the rapture is whether or not we did anything for Jesus. And we'll get rewards for what we did for Jesus, and what we did for ourselves will burn up. And so what it looks like is those rewards will be your rank in the army of the Lord. Because we read in Revelation and Joel and other places that God has an army. And that army comes back with Him on white horses in Armageddon. Well, who would that be? It must be His bride, the church, that comes back with Him. And that's the army, we who are saved. We'll get into that in a different message. So here we have chapter 5, and we see some folks in heaven talking about the Lamb. Who are they? Well, verse, verse 9, they sing a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Well, there were people that are saved by the blood in the church age that are taken up at the rapture, and they're praising God. Now we get to chapter 6. Chapter 6 is where we get what's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
If you've never heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. And I don't have time to read the entire chapter. I wish I could just go verse by verse through the entire book of Revelation. But briefly, let me show you what it says here. The first horse is a white horse. And we're told in verse 2 that he goeth forth conquering and to conquer. And so he's going out and he's killing people. The second horse is a red horse, and he is war. And it says in verse 4 that he should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. The third horse is a black horse, and in verse 5 and 6, it says he had a pair of balances. And he says, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that hurt not the oil and the wine. Hmm. So this horse is about famine. And then the last horse is a pale horse, verse 8. What does he do? He is death. Death and hell rode with him. And also we see some plagues here from this last one. So we have a white horse going out conquering people. Then we have war, a red horse. Then we have famine with a black horse. And then we have a pale horse, plague. Now, <laughs> I don't see how anybody in the world today is still not a Christian if you read the Bible. What we're seeing in our world today is a, a group that calls themselves a religion that believes in a sword and believes in chopping off people's heads with the sword. In the entire Middle East they've overrun, I'm talking about ISIS, not ISIL, I call them ISIS, you can call them whatever they want, radical jihadists, and they believe in making the entire world submit to them so they go around conquering and they've conquered the entire Middle East. Now through refugee programs, they're going into Europe, they're going into America, and their goal is to conquer the world for Islam. Hmm, that sounds a lot like what the Bible says. And then the second horse is war. Well, Jesus warns back here, hey, there'll be war and rumors of war. Well, we're right here before this has taken place, but we're seeing those things starting. So it's not far-fetched to believe that when the tribulation starts, you'll see all those things even more. How about that? And then the black horse was famine. You know what they're talking about? If you listen to the internet and you listen to some of the programs I listen to and you uh, like to look up like I do, economists to see what they say about the economy, they're all in agreement. The economy is about to collapse worldwide and they're scared. <laughs> and rightly so. What will that cause if the economy collapse? Famine. And a collapsed economy means nobody has money. So nobody's going to be able to get food without money. And then the last one is plague. Well, in the Bible, we're told in the last part of this time of the Great Tribulation that people don't repent because of the plagues, because they're pouring out vials of plagues. So we see in order the things that are going to take place in this seven-year period. Go to chapter 6 now. Well, that was chapter 6, excuse me. <clears throat> and then there's some people killed in verse 11. <laughs> chapter 7. We see uh, some people sealed. Chapter 7 talks about Jews being sealed. Well, there's some Jews that are sealed, but also these Jews tie into something else, which I believe is the 144,000. Now, that's quite interesting. 144,000. You know, and then there'll be, and I'll read it in a minute here, two witnesses also. Now, these are people that God sends to the world. And God sends these people to the world for Israel. And they will be witnesses of Jesus Christ to tell Israel, Hey, guess what, Israel? You killed your Messiah back here in the 68th week. Or 69th week. You should have accepted him, but here's your last week and your last opportunity. Now people say, well, we're going to go halfway through the tribulation. We that are Christians and the rapture's halfway through. How can that be? If there's going to be two witnesses coming and preaching and 144,000 witnesses preaching, what will they be preaching? Well, they're not preaching Paul's gospel. Because Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than we, have, than, than we have preached, let them be accursed. Book of Revelation, chapter 14, it says there's an angel in heaven that comes and preaches the everlasting gospel. How can two gospels be preached at the same time? They can't. So Paul and his gospel has to be taken out in order for these witnesses to come and witness to Israel and say, your Messiah was Jesus Christ, accept Him. How can we as Christians be here? 
We won't see those witnesses because our witness is Paul. He's our apostle. And our gospel is grace. In the tribulation, it's come to Jesus. Trust who. I don't have time to get into the who versus what message, but if you get a chance, go to YouTube, look up my video on the difference between the who and the what of salvation, and you'll see that clearly. Chapter 8, we have the seals. And it starts talking about the seals. And there's the seventh seal. Now, the thing about the seals is quite interesting. There's seven seals, then there's seven trumpets, and then there's seven vials. And it's quite interesting that the, the trumpets and the vials really correspond so closely. I don't know if I should write them up here. I don't even know if I have time. A room. I don't really have room. <laughs> Will they fit here? I guess they'll fit here. So let me do this. In the book of Revelation, you have seven trumpets. And you have seven vials. And they're told in different times in these different accounts. But yet they so seem to correspond with one another. Which once again shows that what this is doing is giving four separate accounts of the order of the tribulation period. So when these trumpets take place, the first trumpet, there's hail, there's burning, and there's blood. Okay, you say, well, okay, that's interesting. Well, when the vials, then there'll be a sore and a mark. Well, those don't seem to correspond too much, do they? Well, look at the second one. When the second trumpet's blown, their sea is turned to blood. When the second vial goes out, the sea is turned to blood. So those match. Number three, there's wormwood and the waters become bitter. Well, what happens on the third vial? The fountains of the water turn to blood. You see how they kind of correspond? Number four, the sun, the moon, and the stars, it's mentioned. Well, on the fourth vial poured out, the sun begins to scorch people. Uh, the fifth, the locusts come out of the pit. Well, over here, we've got darkness. And I'm not going to go into the whole thing. You've got to look this up for yourself. I don't have time. I've got to give you something to study, right? But do you see how they seem to correspond? So the seven trumpets and the seven vials seem to take place at the same time, and he just gives you four different separate accounts. And when you look at it all together, it paints a picture of, okay, there's a rapture, and then at the beginning of that first three and a half years of the future seven years, there's two witnesses that show up and 144,000 and they show up and they're living in this time and the Bible teaches that this is the time when the Jews rebuild their temple and worship in it. So the first three and a half years sounds like it's going to be pretty peaceful because the Jews are worshiping in their temple and there's a covenant made with them so that they can worship in their temple. In the middle, in the midst of the week, is when the covenant's broken, they're kicked out of their temple and they have to flee. And God becomes angry with the Antichrist for that. That's when he pours out the, the vials, the trumpets, the other things, the cups of his wrath on the earth. So the first three and a half years, relatively good. You've got 144,000 witnesses and then the two witnesses, which I believe is Moses and Elijah. You can see my video on the two, who are the two witnesses. They, why would they be here? Because they're going to the Jews and telling them, the Messiah is Jesus, the Messiah is Jesus, the Messiah is Jesus. So we paint a picture here. We see, as we read the four separate accounts of the tribulation period in the book of Revelation, of, oh, this is the order of the things that are coming to pass. So most likely, these seven vials and seven trumpets correspond and they're the ones that are thrown out here in the last three and a half years. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation, because all these great, horrible things happen in the earth. Quickly, 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 like I said, I don't have time to go through the entire book of Revelation, but look at Revelation chapter 9. What happens? Something comes out of a pit. Verse 11 and 12, uh, we find that up shows Apollyon. Well, Apollyon, that's, that's Satan. That would be him coming out of the pit to inhabit the body of the Antichrist who dies. Um, 
Oh, man, I, I wanted so much to get more into this, but let's go to skip ahead to chapter 11, okay? Chapter 11, see if I can make this clear. Verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Now, who is worshiping in the altar and the temple of God? The Jews. They rebuild their temple. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say, we are right here today before the, before the rapture. All over the news, everywhere. Israel is talking about rebuilding their temple. Well, if you know anything about Israel and Jerusalem, there is a monstrosity there that's right where the old temple used to be, they claim, and it's called the mosque, the temple mosque, or the mount, or something like that. It's, it's a famous Muslim mosque. So Islam went to the place of where they believed the temple was of the Jews, and they said, eh, we conquered, it's ours, we're going to build our temple, and now you can't have it. And the Jews are sitting there scratching their head going, well, this is our land. We have a book that goes back thousands of years in which God told Abraham, the guy who started us, and Isaac and Jacob, Jacob's troubles, Jews are from Jacob, that this is our land, and yet we have a other religion that built their temple right where ours should be. So something has to take place. Either they're going to blow up that Muslim temple and build their temple there on the spot, or some people have said, well, where the Muslims built their temple was not where the first temple is, and so they'll build their other temple right next to it. I don't know. But I do know the Bible teaches that the Jews will rebuild themselves a temple to worship God in Israel. And guess what? Everything is ready. There's a thing on, on internet. You don't have to look hard if you, if you look for it. There are uh, organizations. They have taken and labeled every stone. They have built every temple instrument of gold and everything. They have everything they could possibly need to rebuild the temple. They just need to do it. And they're asking for permission from the Israeli government. Please, can we rebuild the temple? Now, is that not a coincidence? <laughs> yeah, but is that not fulfillment of prophecy? You know, here we have the Jews, I mean, the uh, Romans destroying the temple. And for almost 2,000 years, the Jews have no temple. And here's a prophecy that says, oh, in the future, in the Jews' temple, and people are scratching their head and goes, what temple? The Jews don't have a temple. But yet they're about to rebuild one. <laughs> Proving that this is going to take place. So that when it is rebuilt, the Antichrist will come in and do the abomination. It's just amazing if you read the Bible. You can't help but see prophecy is true. The Bible is truth. And it's all going to come to pass. So it says here in verse uh, 2, Okay, verse 1 says that they are in the temple worshiping, the Jews. This would be in the beginning of the tribulation period. Verse 4, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So forty-two months, the last three and a half years, the Gentiles take over that Jewish temple, and they rule there. Why are Gentiles in Israel ruling? Because the Antichrist has come in and broken that covenant in the midst of the week and has kicked the Jews out. And now he says, now we got this, and it's ours. And that's when he sits on his throne. So you see the Bible's prophesying all this. Now go to, um, and you know, I'm a little, I'll tell you, if I don't know, I don't know. I'm a little fuzzy. I think maybe these two witnesses might show up over here. Sometimes I've always wondered where they fit. They could be over here for a short time. And I don't have time to go into how they were killed. But let's go to um, Revelation chapter 13 now. Let me show you this. Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his name, or his heads, the name of blasphemy. So it's talking about the beast, the Antichrist. It says that uh, he had great authority, verse 2. But then verse 3, and I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. The Antichrist is wounded. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the beasts wandered after the beast. Huh. All the world wandered after the beast. Verse 4, and they worshiped the dragon. Now, who's the dragon? Satan. So here we have an assassination in the midst of the seven-year pe period of the man of sin, the Antichrist. He has a deadly wound. Well, that means he died. If his wound was deadly, he must have died. He raises again, probably three days, just like Jesus, three days. And he tells everyone, I'm the Messiah, but he's literally Satan incarnate. Now, what does the Bible say about him? Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. 
and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Unless you have a King James Bible, you don't have the word continue. New versions of the Bible change that word. What an important word. If he was already reigning and he continued, what does that mean? That means he was ruling for three and a half years as the man of sin, the Antichrist. But then when he died because of his deadly wound, and Satan became incarnated in that man, the Antichrist, as the son of perdition, he continued 42 months. If he continued 42 months, then he must have had to have been ruling before that. So he must have been the man of sin for three and a half years, and now the son of perdition for the last three and a half years. So I believe from reading the Bible that the tribulation is a future seven years. And during that seven years, we have something take place over and over and over. We have four different accounts in the book of Revelation, and it's all the same, that for the first three and a half years, the Jews are in their temple worshiping, while the Antichrist is in charge with his covenant and relatively peace in the world, more or less. Then something happens in the middle, as the abomination of desolation. The Jews are cast out. Now, I wanted to read this one last passage here in chapter 12. In chapter 12, it says here, let's look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, ye that dwell in them, woe unto the habitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Well, the devil comes down and inhabits a man. And what does he do? When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Well, that would be the Jews. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished, now watch this, for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. You can't get any more. The Bible is so detailed it gives you the exact number of years. A time, well if a time is one year then that's one year. Times, plural, that's got to be at least two, so that makes three. And half a time. Oh, so three and a half years, the Jews, when they leave their temple because the abomination of desolation took place, for three and a half years, a time, a times, and a half a times, 42 months, they are fleeing from the Antichrist and hiding. Now do you see why Jesus said back here, when you see the abomination of desolation take place, flee into the mountains of Judah? Flee from Israel, because you no longer are allowed to worship in your temple. The Antichrist comes in and sits down and says he is God. Now watch, remember I mentioned a while back the flood, Daniel mentioned a flood? Watch what it says here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. And the serpent cast out his mouth water, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The devil tries to drown Israel with some sort of a flood. Verse 16, and the earth opened the... And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So the dragon tries to destroy Israel, but he can't do it. So God protects Israel, his chosen people. Then comes the battle of Armageddon, when God destroys the Antichrist. And that's the end of the tribulation period. Now, I, I wanted to go through some more of, of the book of Revelation, but I just can't. But I tried to give you as much information as I could of what the Bible teaches. And the Bible is very, very clear. I didn't even get into the mark. The Bible teaches that there'll be a mark that the Antichrist gives, and I think that mark will probably be in the last three and a half years, although I don't know. But that mark of the beast, the Bible says if a person takes that mark in their right hand or in their forehead, if you take that mark, when Jesus comes at Armageddon, you're going straight to hell. You don't get saved if you took the mark. That's why Jesus warned the Jews, endure till the end. What does it mean to endure to the end? Well, you have to endure to the end of this. Because if you don't have the mark, you can't buy or sell. So you can't eat. So you've got to endure to the end or else die as a martyr for Jesus. So I tell you what, that's an awful, awful time to live in. And if you're watching this video and you miss the rapture, you're in trouble. But now you know what's going to happen and you'll literally see the ruler of the world assassinated one day. And you'll think, oh, that's so sad because all the world worshipped him and thought he was so great. And then a couple days later, you'll be watching TV and they say, well, it's a miracle. He has risen again. We thought he was dead. I mean, we closed the coffin, and but he wasn't dead. He's alive again. And you mark her down. That is Satan incarnate. Now, you know what's weird? <laughs> I don't want to do this. I don't want to get into this. I don't want to say this. But let me say it in this, this way. There are some people that believe that the Antichrist is here today. 
and they believe he is a certain world leader. I will try to be as uh, nondescript as I can. And he's a cert he is a certain free uh, leader of the free world, and he is running things from behind the scenes. All right. I just heard yesterday someone sent me an email, and I just about <laughs> passed out and fell backwards in my chair. Because they said that the United Nations, and by the way, I haven't mentioned the United Nations yet, but the United Nations are the one that will be ruling in this world. And when the Antichrist takes over, he's going to set up what's called the New World Order. Well, somebody sent me this thing that said that the UN wants to vote, now get this, on allowing the head of the UN a seven-year term. <laughs> Now, I don't know if it's four years now or what it is, but the Secretary General of the United Nations has so many years that he's allowed to, 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 to be in charge, and then he has to be voted on for a new one. Why would the UN all of a sudden come out and say, you know what we'd like? We'd like the, the Secretary General of the UN to be in for seven years exactly before we vote him out. Why seven? You know, most countries, you're president for four years or something. Why seven? The only answer I can come to is because the Bible says the Antichrist rules for seven years. <laughs> you can't get away from the Bible. Everything that is happening today is coming to pass exactly as was prophesied from the Word of God. Our only hope, our blessed hope, is the rapture, to get out before this person takes over. Are you saved? Revelation 19, 17 through 21 tells us that in this time period of the Tribulation will be so horrible because so many people will die. Revelation, I said 19, Revelation 9. You know how many people will die? Revelation 9, 17 through 20 says, uh, By these three, 18, was the third part of men killed. A third part of all men in the world. Do you know there's over 7 billion people in the world today? What is a third of them? Well, if it was 6 billion, a third would be... Um, two billion people. So if you have seven to what? 2.3 billion people die in this tribulation period from all the war and everything. Can you imagine that? You know how many dead people 2.3 billion people are? That's a lot of dead people. You might be one of them. There's no guarantee that you'll even make it through that seven years. So are you saved? If you're watching this and that rapture hasn't taken place yet, it's not too late to get saved. You say, well, how do I get saved? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, is the, is the gospel. And the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. You see, the Antichrist will die. And he'll tell everybody, yeah, but look at me, I rose again from the dead. And look what I did. I fulfilled the scriptures, I am the Messiah. All he's doing is imitating what Jesus did. But you know, when he died, he didn't die for our sins. Jesus, when he died, he was God manifest in the flesh who died for our sins. You see, the Antichrist just tries to imitate. Satan tries to imitate Jesus, but he's not Jesus. So how do you get saved? You trust the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for our sins. If you want to be saved and go to heaven at the rapture so you don't have to go through this horrible tribulation period, You've got to come to Jesus Christ and trust Him as your Savior. Trust the Gospel. Trust His death, burial, and resurrection that He died for your sins. I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. So that's the message. I hope it has been encouraging and a blessing to you. If you are saved, I hope it will help you to study more the Word of God. But I hope it will, more than anything, help you to warn others. Because, oh my goodness, everything's coming to pass exactly what, like the Bible says. The whole push is a global government. What would a global government be in this world but the Antichrist kingdom in which he rules and reigns? If you're a globalist, then what you're saying is, I can't wait till Satan comes because you're building his kingdom for him. So everything is coming to pass exactly like the Bible says. The Jews, they can't wait to build their temple. And all these prophecies from many years ago, what would it be? 2,500 years ago are about to come to pass. So I appreciate you for watching this. I hope it's been encouraging to you. I'll get out of the way. Some people will say, I want to I wanna look at that and you know have a screensaver or whatever. But uh, come back next time as we look at more in detail who this Antichrist figure is. Uh, I believe you'll recognize him when he comes. Uh, it won't be hard to see him and see who he is. 
And the Bible gives us many, many clues. And thankfully, when he is revealed as the head of the United Nations and the head of the world, that's exact moment that the world declares him the ruler of everything, that's when the rapture takes place. So you better be saved. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.